Next, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. talks about the current state of the war waged by Russia. She also talked about what victory for Ukraine looks like and thanked journalists for their coverage of the war. This is just over an hour. All right, so are we ready? Are we ready? We've got C-SPAN cameras here. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Linda Feldman. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief of the Christian Science Monitor. Our guest today is Oksana Markarova, Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States. This is her first visit to a monitor gathering for reporters. Usually we do breakfast, but today it's coffee. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Ambassador Markarova is a native of Rivne, Ukraine and a graduate of the National University of Kyiv Mohila Academy in Ukraine. And then she came to the U.S. for her master's in public finance and trade at Indiana University. Ambassador Makarova worked in the private sector before joining the Ukrainian civil service, including two years as Ukraine's finance minister from 2018 to 2020. And then she became ambassador to the U.S. in February of 2021. And I also must add that the ambassador is a mother of four, and I am in, in awe of everything that she does. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, now for the ground rules. We are on the record here. Please, no live blogging or tweeting. In short, no filing of any kind while uh, our coffee is underway. And there's no embargo once the session ends at 3 o'clock. We will email pictures and a rough transcript of this event to all reporters here shortly after the, the uh, coffee ends. And as many of you know, if you'd like to ask a question, please send me a signal, and I will call on as many of you as time permits. Now, uh, Madam Ambassador, if you would like to make opening remarks, the floor is yours just for briefly, or if you'd like, I can just go right into questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, as an opening remarks, I just wanted to say that I want to use this opportunity to thank all journalists. And unfortunately, as of today, we have lost already 24 in Ukraine. And uh, it's as painful to see the journalists die on the line of duty as to see our armed forces die, as to see our children, men, and, and uh, women die. But without journalists being there, I think the fight was, would not be as effective as it is, because truth is one of the a uh, few weapons that we have when you fight against somebody who's that big, that brutal, uh, with no respect to any international rules or the rules of engagement, uh, essentially with some, some, something like Russia with no red lines, it's only the truth and how quickly you can share the truth with everyone is helping us. And it's because we have these brave women and men who were with us and are with us on the front lines everywhere possible we're able to do so. So it gives us, you know, special pain to President Zelensky, to everyone in, in Ukraine when we lose journalists in Ukraine. And just yesterday, another one, um, you know, uh, uh, Alexander Makhov, who's known to so many people in Ukraine, but again, just to join the, uh, the, the, the group of international, American, Ukrainian, even Russian journalists who, who are killed and some of them are killed specifically. They are targeted because they had press on them, which makes it even harder. So with that, you know, I just wanted to say that first, big thank you to all of your colleagues who are there, to all of, to all of you who are covering it here. Uh, but also that today is the 71st day, which is ending in Ukraine, of uh, this fight that actually started eight years ago. And I know everyone is focused on this face of the war because it's so brutal, because it's everywhere, because it's full-fledged war that returned to Europe after the World War II, which we thought would never, we would never see it at that magnitude. But it actually started in 2014 when Russia attacked us for the first time. And uh, we live in that war for the past eight years. So with that, I just want to say, you know, that regardless of how hard it is, we will not give up. And I know I've been saying it before the war that Ukrainians will resist. And I know many people have been skeptical. 
but now we can not only say that we will resist, but that we do resist and we will not give up and we will not surrender. And thank you for being with us in this fight. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Ambassador. And um, so I'll start with a few questions, and then and then we'll move around to reporters around the room. Um, I think a lot of us are looking ahead to May 9th, the the Russian uh, Victory Day holiday, and the uh, reported plans by President Putin to declare that Donetsk, Luhansk, the city of Kherson, are now Russian territories. What will Ukraine's response be? Well, there is a couple of questions in, in this one question, actually. Yeah. One is, you know, the remembrance of the end of the Second World War. And Russians had been really effective, or they thought so in the past, in rewriting the history and lying about so many events. But we, people who believe in truth and who believe in, in, in access to information, remember very well that the war, World War II, like Ukrainian world war right now, did not start uh, 71 days ago, the World War II also did not start in 1941, like Russians are trying and were trying to, to show it during the Soviet times. It started in 1939, and it started by two countries, by Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Uh, with the, uh, so, you know, we Ukrainians, with the whole world, will mourn on 8th of May, and we will remember everyone who's fallen on the, on the May, May 8th and 9th, and I think, you know, it's, it's very cynical of Russian Federation to, right now, when they, A, brutally attacked sovereign state, when they started a, a, a war in, in the middle of Europe, when they do exactly what Nazis did, you know, with uh, all the symbols, with genocide, with killing Ukrainians, only because we're Ukrainians, with, you know, ridiculous... Uh, manifestations of anti-Semitism just recently by Minister Lavrov, you know, trying to uh, attack the very notion of, uh, uh, of, of, of the Holocaust and essentially uh, trying to spread lies that it's almost Jewish people who kill Jewish people, with them targeting Babun Yar, with them targeting churches in Ukraine, targeting mosques. Uh, so I think, you know, what they have to do is actually go ahead, A, stop this aggression, be withdrawn from our territory and uh, repent their sins rather than try to use and misuse the notion of uh, a great anniversary of the end of the Nazi war and liberation of Europe and liberation of Ukraine for their own purposes. So whatever they plan for the May 9th, whether it's going to be some kind of parade in Moscow or what we heard, some kind of parades in uh, some of the occupied areas. Uh, you know, whatever they do in Ukraine is just uh, war crimes, aggression, and they have no right to declare anything a Russian territory. Ukraine is peaceful, sovereign country. We will, some parts of, of Ukraine, you know, unfortunately and tragically are illegally occupied right now by the Russian force. But even in Kherson, you know, which has been under occupation for a long time, on a daily basis we see ordinary Ukrainians, armless, going to the main square and saying, it's Ukraine, go out from our city. Even in Mariupol, which is 95% destroyed, which has been, you know, erased some parts of it from, from, from the earth, even there on Azovstal, our brave defenders, the two regiments that are there, uh, are holding in being fully encircled with civilians that are there, with Russia is not allowed to get out through the humanitarian corridors, uh, promising that for many weeks now. So even there, Ukrainian flag still stands. So again, you know, they might resort to any lies. I mean, we, we all saw and heard so many of those. First, they were telling us they will not attack us. Remember, since last April, Constantly, they said, no, it's just uh, exercises. We're not going to attack. Then they said, you know, it's a special operation. Then they said they're liberating Ukrainians. Then we didn't find, not surprisingly to us, surprisingly to them, 
Ukrainians who wants to be liberated, but actually found a lot of Ukrainians who resisted and who wanted to live peacefully in their country. Now they are fighting with some kind of Nazism, which the only Nazism you can fight is like actually in Russian Federation. So again, nothing will surprise us, but we will not agree with anything. And uh, we know that our friends and partners, everyone who believes in principles, values, democracy and freedom, will also see what it is. So I noticed that you were you were in Kiev recently. You were yes. you went there. Uh, were you, you were there with Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin. Um, what was your takeaway from that meeting, and how has it affected how you're carrying on your role as ambassador? Well, it was I think very important that both Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin went to see President Zelensky in Kiev, and it makes a difference to be there and to witness it and. Uh, We've seen a number of leaders going to Kyiv before that. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw some leaders going, you know, not only to Kyiv, but to Bucha and to Borodyanka, all these liberated places, and to witness what actually happened there. Um, so I think it was very good and productive meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you can always discuss in person more than you can discuss through telephone conversations and, and uh, VTCs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, w it was great that uh, the president and his team, our president's team, and Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin with their teams were able to really sit down and discuss where we are, you know, the situation on the ground, what we need, uh, and, and coordinate how we can more effectively get to, uh, to peace. Was but that your first visit to Ukraine since the invasion? Yes. So what were your impressions, and did you get outside of Kyiv at all? Uh, well, yes, I slept in my house, which is on the outskirts of Bucha. So, wow. um, you know, it's, it was, of course, it was very good to be back home, even for one day. Mm -hmm. It was surreal. I mean, my husband went back home when the war started, so I, you know, I saw it through his eyes, through his videos, through talking to him. But it's one thing, you know, to see it on video. It's another thing to witness uh, yourself. Of course, the, you know, when I arrived, the bodies were not already on the streets. You know, it was uh, a week, almost, almost two weeks after uh, the home place was liberated. But the destruction is devastating. And it's very hard to understand why would they shoot at residential buildings? Why would they uh, shoot at the supermarkets? Why would they shoot at all of the civilian objects? But then again, you learn of the atrocities, you know, then you forget about the, the, the buildings and, and the supermarkets and hospitals because you learn about the killings and tortures and raping everyone. It's, it's just beyond any understanding. So, you know, at the beginning of this war, we were always saying, you know, about the Russian aggression and calling them the Russian army, but that's not how army uh, behaves, you know, it's just a group of war criminals which essentially do not have any respect for human life. So that only gives us more reinforcement and we work even more active with our partners to get all the military support we can because we understand that every day that any part of Ukraine stays under occupation, people there are subjected to all these inhumane uh, war crimes. So the faster we can liberate our country, the faster we can drive Russians out and back to, to their country, the right. more lives we can save. And it's really, it's really that urgent. Of course, it was good to be home, you know, to see the dogs. Your, your the house cats. is okay? Your neighborhood's okay? Yes, my father-in-law's house is destroyed, but our house is hmm. miraculously and, okay. And where's your father-in-law's house? It's at the same place. In the same, we will same live area? In the same wow. area. So. Okay. All right. Uh, Peter Martin from Bloomberg. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what does victory look like for Ukraine in this war? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, we are a peaceful, sovereign country, and all we want to do is just live peacefully within our internationally recognized bodies, borders. So essentially, you know, in 2014 when Russia attacked us, uh, we always said that we will never recognize the illegal annexation of Crimea and illegal attack on Donetsk and Lugansk. 
And even though we had all the legal rights to take them with force, we never planned to do so. We always wanted to use the diplomatic solutions to restore our territorial integrity. But essentially the victory for us is when we will have no Russian troops on our territory, when we will restore our territorial integrity and sovereignty, and when all those responsible for these horrific crimes will be taken into account. And that's when we will start rebuilding our country. And do you include Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk? In Crimea was, out, is, out of and everything. always will be Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, as uh, our president repeatedly said, you know, we are ready to negotiate at any point in time. We are not ready to, to, to surrender, and we are not ready to compromise on the, uh, you know, principal issues for us. Now, how to get to that victory, that's a question. I mean, we realize that it cannot be, it, it might be not a straightforward thing, right? You know, we wish ideally, we just wish, you know, that Russians are out quickly from everywhere and they stop shooting. But, you know, right now with all the coalition of the partners and allies that we have and all the support and the United Nations condemning the aggression and condemning their actions and the international court actually telling them to stop as early as on March 16, and they simply disregard. So it's it, the, 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 you know, the, the, to get to this victory might be, might be more difficult than to talk about it, of course. But we, we know that this is what we have to, to get with it. The peace, of course, is something that we pray and want to get to, but justice is a very important element of it. Uh, Rachel Oswald from CQ. Thanks. Um, there's growing bipartisan talk on Capitol Hill about using fro frozen Russian government central bank assets, seizing them and liquidating them and using the proceeds to benefit the Ukrainian people and reconstruction. Um, that might require new legislation to do, and it might also um, have unintended legal consequences if there's any eventual peace settlement with Moscow, um, where Moscow might could insist that it be paid back. Um, and, it, and obviously the European Union, the United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, they've also all frozen significant sums of Russian government money. What is your government's take on this debate? Well, again, President Zelensky and the government have been very clear. First, we asked for the massive sanctions and isolating of Russia already, which means uh, sanctioning all the governmental entities, frozen all the assets that they have, but also private, private companies, because there is no such thing as private banks or private, uh, you know, uh, uh, drilling companies in Russia. All of them are fueling this war. All of them are working together with Putin and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, the Russian state in order to support, finance, and facilitate the war in Ukraine. So we not only fully support, but we ask still the United States and all of our friends and allies to toughen the sanctions and to widen the sanctions. So for example, out, you know, Russia has 330 banks. The majority of them are still not sanctioned. And we ask our partners here to put all of them on the full blocking sanctions list, the SDN list, and we ask to deswift as many as possible. They should not be, uh, you know, capable of doing anything unless Russian Federation stops being a terrorist state. Equally, we ask the, uh, the, the Russia to be designated as the state financing terrorism. After what they're doing in Ukraine, after what they've done in Syria, what they've done poisoning people on the streets of London, you know, uh, killing MH17, attacking Georgia in 2008, I think we have quite a number of uh, facts on the table already that would justify calling them a, a state sponsor in terrorism. We also ask to, to freeze whatever assets they have abroad. And yes, we fully support the idea to use those frozen assets uh, in the future to compensate Ukraine and to use this money to, for, for the rebuilding and reconstruction effort. And the destruction is huge. If you look in Kharkiv, again, Mariupol, Chernihiv, so many of our villages and cities are destroyed more than 50 percent. 
We've lost dozens of universities. Lost completely. There are no buildings there. We've lost dozens of uh, hospitals. Uh, not to mention regular schools, you know, uh, people's buildings. In Borodyanka, you know, we, the, the small city on the outskirts of, of Kiev, where 40,000 people lived, all high-rise buildings are destroyed, all of them. There is nothing left. So, so, so yes, it would be, I think, not only fair, but actually, um, you know, very according <coughs> to the international law practices to use this uh, frozen assets to confiscate them and use them for, uh, for, the, for the reconstruction processes. And in some cases, when the new legislation is required, we see a number of our partners already discussing it. President Biden just recently, together with this new uh, request for additional supplementary budget for 33 billion, also submitted the administration's ideas on how this could be uh, confiscated and used. And we fully support this. So again, when you say, you know, Russia might say something, uh, I think, you know, we still, even though there is 71 days of this uh, hot aggression phase from Russia, we still are in the reactive uh, mode. I think it's time for all of us who believe in uh, democracy and freedom, like Ukraine had to do 17 months a day, to stop being afraid and essentially move to what we want to say to Russia, what we believe is, is the right thing to say, rather than reflecting always how they would react to this. You know, they've already shown how small respect they have for everything that is dear to all of us. Uh, Juliana Schäuble from Tagesspiegel. Yeah, short questions. Um, the first one would be, um, do you think your definition of victory is shared by the Western Alliance? Is the U.S., does they de do they define the same um, definition of victory in Ukraine as you do? And the second question is, um, you have a very outspoken colleague in Berlin. Um, I would like to ask you what you think of his way of communicating and if diplomacy changes in war times, it has to change. Well, on the definition of victory, look, um, it's, we know what we want, and I think every country, every, it, Ukraine is not unique here, deserves to live in peace in this country's recognized board, board, borders. It's one of the founding uh, principles of the UN Charter. It's something, and Ukraine is one of the founding members of the UN. And. Uh, I think if we are serious about it, not, you know, like, yes, it's, it's, we believe in it, but not for all countries. Then since 2014, we all have to see for what it is. U Ukraine, Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity have been violated in 2014, and it has to be restored. Now, again, being a peaceful nation, we never wanted to be restored through the military means. We wanted to be restored through the diplomatic means. That's why, regardless of whether we like them or not, we stick to the Minsk Accords and we worked really hard through all the Normandy formats and others. And that's why in 2021 we started the Crimean platform and the inaugural meeting where 46 countries joined us uh, actually in, in the Crimea platform, which was, uh, which was put in place in order to be a diplomatic solution and a, a, a path to how to restore our territorial integrity with regard to Crimea, because Crimea is Ukraine. So I think, you know, again, looking at, we don't even need to ask other countries whether they share our view of victory, because if you look at all of our friends and allies, since 2014, they all said that they respect our territorial integrity and sovereignty. They all said that they will never accept or recognize either annexation of Crimea or the brutal illegal invasion in Donetsk and Lugansk. So I think we all are on the same page. And again, the 140, 40, 41 country that condemned at the UN General Assembly this aggression also agreed that what Russia is doing is a crime. So the victory in this situation should be a restoration of justice. Now, whether, how quickly we'll get there 
and uh, whether you know is it going to be right away is it going to be staged is it, it's difficult to to discuss when we are talking right now here and the bombs are falling on the peaceful cities of Ukraine as we speak or the Mariupol is being destroyed and pounded with all the heavy power and artillery as we speak and people are being raped and killed and children have been have been tortured as we speak somewhere in Ukraine so you know we don't know how quickly we'll get there but one thing we understand and we know that it's existential for us the choice is very clear for Ukrainians we either win and defend our country or we die and it's very you know in, in, in a situation like that, the majority of decisions are becoming very clear. If we want to survive as nation and save as many Ukrainians as possible, we need to win. That's why our very brave armed forces are fighting sometimes in, in most unbelievable situations, like these two regiments in Mariupol, modern day heroes. That's why our president, against all the advices maybe, said, I'm staying in Kiev. I'm here. I'm fighting. We will not uh, surrender. We'll, we'll fight. And he will stay there until we win. That's why so many Ukrainians, ordinary Ukrainians, you know, who, you know, bread growers, IT specialists, all of them are soldiers. And that kind of leads to your next question about the diplomats. Of course, there are diplomatic protocols. Of course, we, there are rules. But today, all of us are soldiers of our country. So we are diplomats. We are, um, but, but like, like other people on the ground, you know, who are cooks and farmers and others, at this moment, we all fight for our country. So sometimes I also can be very direct and maybe uncomfortable. But I have to do it in order to defend my country. All right, to your left, Jeff Earle from Daily Mail. Uh, I wanted to ask you one about U.S. domestic politics, because I know you have to watch that closely. There's pretty broad U.S. support for humanitarian and military aid for Ukraine. Um, but number one, I wonder if you see that as sustainable in the longer term, now that it's looking like a potentially longer conflict. And I also wanted to ask about some, you know, there is a bit of a partisan split developing, and with some Republicans critical of Ukraine and of President Zelensky, from President Trump calling the country corrupt to Madison Cawthorn, uh, had something to say about the president as well. So my question is, do you view that as growing? And is that concerning? And how will Ukraine res respond since you've been through all these changes in administrations in, uh, if things go the other way in two years from now? That's uh, a question. I, in two years from now, I think that whoever can answer that question we all should pay them money to, to know. Uh, but, but very good question, you know. The bipartisan support that we have is very important for Ukraine to, to keep. And we really value the fact that actually the Ukraine is uniting different aisles of the, of the Congress right now, which is very important. That's why we were able to get such a, such a large and, uh, you know, sig significant and uh, quick support from the United States. Uh, so we're trying very hard to not to get into the local political issues. And I know it's been, it's been something not very easy in the past. Uh, but also I have to know, you know, to, to, to mention, you know, since I've been a Minister of Finance uh, and worked at the Ministry of Finance after the Revolution of Dignity and worked in private equity in Ukraine before that, uh, Sometimes Ukraine was viewed through the lenses of Russian propaganda. It's not to say that we didn't have a corruption. We had, especially during the time when Ukraine was run by the Russian uh, puppets, the, you know, the president and others who auctioned, you know, when we had the Minister of Defense and the, Minister, and the Secret Service uh, heads who had Russian passports, you know, during the Yanukovych times, that was the time since 2000, you know, uh, 2010 through 2014 until people of Ukraine said no and drove them out and all of them left to Russia, not to other places. Uh, but those four years have been the years when Ukraine has been destroyed specifically on the orders of Russia. 
our armed forces, our economy. So when we came after the revolution of dignity, the new team into the, into, into the government, you know, literally there was a day in, 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 in 2014 when we had put 10,000 euros on the single treasury account of the country. The country was robbed, uh, the Crimea was stolen, the Donbass was destroyed, the 20% of the GDP was out, and we had to rebuild and stabilize the country from scratch. And the reform that Ukraine, Ukraine did during the past eight years, while still being at war, while being attacked on the, on the are amazing. Now, did we build the ideal country after eight years? Of course not. You know, we did not have our own uh, sovereignty for the past 400 years. Ukraine has been occupied since we lost the sovereignty in the Battle of Poltava of 1708. That's been a long time ago. So it was always somebody else who was, uh, and whether it was Russian Empire or Soviet Union or, or, you know, we were occupied and we were always fighting for the independence. And we were always, you know, we had a brief period of independence in 1918 for only two years. And then we brutally crushed by the Soviets. And what they did right after that is the Holodomor, the genocide in 1932-33. So we know what happens when we lose sovereignty. I'm telling all of this historical facts only to describe that, you know, when we regained independence in 1991, yes, we received some of the institutions from the Soviet Union, but they were never uh, efficient to start with, and they were never Ukrainian. So we had a long way to, 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 to build it back and to actually create our own institutions. But we essentially only started doing that after the revolution of 2014, when we started getting rid of all these pro-Russian elements, when we started getting rid of all the influence that was actually there to destroy the country and to prevent us from either joining the European Union or NATO or, or any other democratic uh, structures. So right now, I think, you know, the whole Ukraine is very united around one issue, how to defend our country. And we're defending it. And I see even, you know, the, the places where we fought uh, with corruption, where we see, you know, that it's not even something that people would, you know, discuss because corruption right now is a crime against your own country. So um, we also are fighting for democracy, meaning that we are fighting for all the journalists to be there, including the investigative journalists. So after we win, of course, there will be a very difficult work to rebuild the country. And there will also be a very difficult work to continue on the reforms, because we still are on the path of the European integration. So we need to become more and more compliant with the European Union standards, rules, and legislation. So a lot of work will have to be done then, and we will continue doing that. But coming back to your original question about the local politics here, United States is our strategic ally, strategic friend, number one. And we really treasure this uh, support that we have now. And I think, you know, today is, uh, the Liberation Day for the Netherlands, the 5th of May, when, they, when, the, when, uh, when the Kingdom of Netherlands was liberated 71 days ago, uh, 77 years ago, uh, from the Nazis. And, uh, you know, there is this big uh, bell here in Arlington as an appreciation to American people for the help. This is what we feel, the appreciation to American people for everything that America is doing for us. And we feel that this support is very bipartisan. And we would like to keep it that way. When we talk to American people, when we talk to American Congress, when we talk to American administration, we just, it, it's American for us, regardless of the political parties. Mm. So are you Joseph Clark? Joseph Clark. Right, from the Washington Times, Joseph Clark. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for doing this this afternoon. Uh, I did want to stay in uh, U.S. politics for a bit, if we may. If, um, specifically with regard to the $33 billion in additional uh, uh, supplemental funding for Ukraine, uh, President Biden requested the funding last week from Congress. Uh, Democrats have proposed attaching the funding to a somewhat contentious um, uh, 
additional COVID uh, aid. Uh, Republicans have pushed back that, hey, this should be separate. Um, they argue that it politicizes the vote. Uh, they also argue that it could tie up a vote, which hasn't moved uh, this week. Are you disappointed with the, uh, the lack of movement this week? Can you comment on the dynamics uh, surrounding the bill? And then if I may, a, a separate question, and I can present that now. Uh, uh, this week in a uh, Senate appropriations uh, hearing, two senators raised questions as to whether U.S. weaponry was making it efficiently to the front lines when it, once it uh, entered Ukraine. Secretary Austin said that that is something that he speaks with high-level Ukrainian officials about on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. but that uh, there are no U.S. Uh, military personnel or U.S. personnel in any capacity to verify that the, the uh, arms make it to the front line. So can you comment on that as well? Let me start with the second one. So everything that we receive from the U.S. and from all other friends and allies are being transported to the front lines as efficient as we can. Again, you have to understand we are under constant shelling and, and uh, rocket uh, targets from, from the Russians. Uh, but everything is put, is transferred as efficiently and put to a very good use. And I think we've seen it in the battle for Kyiv and we're seeing in this battle in the east and south where Russians are essentially deploying everything they have and they are shooting you know, tens of thousands of rounds a day and they yet to make the progress that they have been uh, trying to make so I think we, we, like at the beginning of the war, when everyone was kind of predicting that Kiev would fall in two days, then four days, then definitely in a week. Uh, and then right now we also see that, you know, the advance of Russians, regardless of their air superiority, and regardless of the fact that there is so much more that they have and they can shoot at us, has not been uh, what they planned it to be. And the reason, because everything that we are getting from our friends and allies is being used by our armed forces in a very, very efficient way. And uh, Secretary Austin is absolutely right. I mean, the tele telephone conversations between him and our Minister of Defense, between Chairman Milley and our Ch Chief of Staff Zaluzhny, uh, between all other levels of communications, including the embassy staff, has been remarkable. So um, we share the information, we discuss, we coordinate, we consult. And I think, you know, our partners here have pretty good understanding of where we are, what we do, why we do it, um, especially with the, with the equipment that the U.S. is providing us with. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the first on the 33 billion. Of course, we will not get into the internal discussions and it's up for the Congress to do it. One thing that I will say and one thing that I keep saying to all of our friends and allies, not only in the Ukrainian Caucasus, but with everyone, and I've, I've, I talk to senators and uh, congressmen and congresswomen on a daily basis now, is that time is of the essence here. So this 33 billion that uh, President Biden and administration suggested to be adopted, in which 20 billion is for the military, uh, support. 8.5 billion is for uh, the, the, the financial and energy and economic support, and the rest is for humanitarian. It's essential for us to get it as soon as possible. Because even if you look at the public announcements, you will see that the previous bill that was adopted at the beginning of February, we already exhausted almost all that was there for the presidential drawdowns and other programs. So in order to sustain the effort, in order to keep getting all the so much needed support, the administration and the Pentagon needs to have the authorization from Congress. So the faster this bill is adopted, the faster we will be able to, to get additional supplies. So this is something that we are communicating clearly. So regardless of how it's done, again, we are not getting into the internal processes, but it has to be done as, as soon as possible. Mm. All right, so we've got 20 minutes left, and I've got a bunch of names. So let's, everybody going forward, let's just do one question. Diana, is it Glebova or Glebova? Yes, the second one. From <laughs> Glebova, from the Daily Caller. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. And my question pertains to the Azov Regiment. In 2018, the U.S. House of Representatives said that any funding from the packages coming to Ukraine from the United States 
uh, would not make it to the Azov Battalion on account of allegations of neo-Nazi ties. And experts and investigative journalists that have come to visit that group do say that uh, some of their behaviors, particularly the crest that they use, has a symbol that seemingly appears to look like a neo-Nazi symbol used in Nazi Germany, the Wolf Sangel. And uh, President Zelensky went on Fox News a few weeks ago and said that uh, the Azov Battalion is what it is, the members are what they are. And my question is, if there is so much concern from the United States about this group, why doesn't Zelensky say, please stop any, um, any behaviors whatsoever that could you know, allege you to have neo-Nazi ties. Why don't you remove the crest? Why don't you stop these behaviors? Well, what is there to stop if there is no neo-Nazi behavior there? It's one of the Russian propagandas that have been spreading since 2014, when the Azov uh, Regiment, which is part of the National Guard of Ukraine, uh, which has uh, and has been always part of the National Guard and has been one of the most capable uh, units that didn't allow Russians to take the uh, Mariupol in 2014. So um, I don't see the same people who spread this lies about Azov talking about the Z symbol which uh, Russia is using and that can resemble a lot of things like part of the swastikas or whatever. But I think you know it's, it's just a matter of four years, for 30 years, you know, Russia has been spreading lies about Ukraine and about us, uh, you know, being whatever Nazis, like they were spreading lies during the Soviet times about, uh, you know, us uh, being anti-Semitic or something. Well, as it turned out, and I think it's clear to everyone now, while Ukraine is number four is in the list of righteous, when we are one of the very few countries that have a president with Jewish roots, when we are one of the first, uh, uh, one of the few countries which has the definition, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, not only adopted in Ukraine, but actually included into our legislation. So if uh, some in Ukraine would say what, what uh, Minister Lavrov said, uh, that he would be criminally liable for, for saying what Minister Lavrov said uh, in Russia, you know, just recent anti-Semitic comments. So um, they, you know, a lot of people, when they spread this information, we have supplied this information to Congress and to everyone about uh, the Azov and other parts of the National Guards, you know, we invited so many times everyone to come and see how they train. And there are quite a number of, uh, uh, you know, reports by the Western media from, from the trainings essentially to see that, you know, there is nothing of that sort. Now, you know, yes, they've chosen the, uh, the symbol, which is the two Ukrainian letters crossing each other. Now, we can, you know, I'm, I'm not a part of the regiment, you know, we can talk about no, you do, do, you, do you have to take a look how or what, who can uh, see what it looks like, you know? But again, the, then any symbol you can, you can also find that uh, resemble of something or, or something. We can clearly say that, you know, the people who lead it, in, in the Azov, and who, who has led it for the past three, four years, as, as much as I, you know, we know them, you know, we did not hear any complaints about, about this. The complaints that were there and when we were sent any information were checked by the um, uh, uh, Minister of Internal Affairs, which is the coordinating ministry for, for this. So again, but I, I think, you know, it's very difficult to get through this massive Russian propaganda which was there, and we understand why specifically they targeted that regiment because that regiment has been at the forefront fighting with, with Russian troops since 2014. So, you know, right now when they are bravely defending uh, Azovstal and Mariupol, and we saw the resurgence here in, in some of the media, again, the old articles about that. I mean, of course, uh, it's, it's, it, it makes sense for them now to, 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 to target them but because them and the Marines, who are now the two regiments that are in Mariupol, are the true heroes. You know, they are you know, shown by example how even when you are in the young age, you are ready to sacrifice your life 
to defend the civilians there, to defend the flag, and to, you know, defend your country with the ultimate sacrifice, with your life. All right, to your right, Ketavad Gorgistani from France 24 Television. Thank you so much for doing this. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned a little bit earlier European integration. Uh, this process is ongoing. The questionnaire was uh, given to the EU recently. Uh, I wanted to know how important this process is at this time currently for Ukraine and how confident are you that this process can go through in the short term rather than the longer term? Thank you. It's very important again. Talking about the values in which we believe, you know, it goes back to, to the lies that Russia is spreading. But we are not only peaceful, but we are inclusive. <clears throat> Ukraine has always been very tolerant. You know, we have uh, now fighting in our army people from different religions, different nationalities. Just yesterday was, uh, two days ago was, you know, beautiful day in some of the regiments where the Muslims in Ukrainian army uh, celebrated the end of uh, uh, Ramadan and they were praying together with uh, Christians and Jewish and you know it was such a beautiful scene of the brotherly and sisterly love regardless of, of the religion so um, when our Prime Minister was here, he clearly said that we have four priorities when, when he talked to every government official here. First is military support. Second is sanctions. Third is financial and energy and other support to Ukraine. And first is support for our Euro-Atlantic and European aspirations. Because ultimately, this is what we are fighting for. For democracy, for freedom, and to be able to live like who we are, Europeans. So it's very important. Now you have seen, and I, it's remarkable that during the times of war, we pay so much attention to it, but it's, it's very important. This is the light at the end of the tunnel for Ukrainian people. And again, this is the reason in 2013 when people went on Maidan to protest. You know, if you remember, the situation in Ukraine was not really easy before that. And the Yanukovych government has been really difficult on business. There was prosecution of journalists. There was, but the thing that got people to go on the street and protest was when Yanukovych returned from Moscow or from Sochi at that time. And he said, we are not going to sign the association agreement with Europe. That's what united everyone in Ukraine. You know, liberals, conservatives, nationalists, uh, you know, uh, everyone said, that's a no. You know, we're going to the street, we will protest. So it has been very important in 2013. It has been very important during the last eight years uh, when we reformed the country and where we were going. And it's very important right now because ultimately we are defending our country exactly to, to, for, for, for those values. Now, we completed the questionnaire. Uh, during the week, as President Zelensky said, when uh, President von der Leyen came to Kiev and presented us with the decision to actually review our candidacy. So the questionnaire for candidacy is complete. We have submitted it to European Union. Uh, we'll see, you know, I think Ukrainian people count on that the decisions in the European Union will be taken as soon, of course, they, as they can take them. But we understand all the problems. We understand that the final stages, of course, would require, you know, to be taken in the peaceful time. But we hope that we will be able to move as soon as mm. we can. Okay, to your right, Jill Doherty from CNN at Georgetown. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. Um, you know, I, your attention rightly is on Ukraine. But there are worrying signals that this could expand. We have whatever is going on in Moldova. It's not very clear uh, with the explosions. And so the, the question that I have is really, you know, how far will Putin go with this? Do you fear that he could expand the war to other parts of you know, Georgia, uh, Moldova, maybe the Baltics and beyond? How far, how, how far do you think he would go? Uh, excellent question. When we, when he started the, this cycle of escalation in April 2021, and a lot of people were discussing what are the, you know, how is it going to end? Uh, 
I remember I was responding to one of the questions, and as, as military people say, for any war, you need three elements. You need intent, you need capabilities, and you need window of opportunity. I think we have to all be uh, clear about one fact, that the intent uh, in Putin's mind, and unfortunately not only Putin minds, in, in Russian Federation, in Russian people, uh, was always to restore the empire. So everything we heard in the articles, everything we heard discussion, discussions at different forums, you know, we always heard that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the biggest mistake. We always heard that, you know, you know, these attacks right now that we see against, uh, you know, I mean, verbal attacks against Poles, against uh, everyone who's, uh, who's standing up. So I think the intent to go as far as possible and to attack anyone uh, who is democratic and especially who wants to, who, who was in the same Soviet prison and became democratic is and was always there. The capabilities, of course, are large, but thanks to Ukraine, I think these capabilities are diminishing rapidly now. And the window of opportunity, it's only when we together as democratic countries show weaknesses, when he thinks that he can do it, or when the Russian Federation thinks that they can do it, they will do it. So unfortunately, not a very strong response in 2014 to the first attack, not a very strong response to MH17 and taken into to, to justice Putin and all of those who shot the plane. Uh, they, not a very strong response to Syria. And what he has done in Syria led to this full-fledged war. Now, that's why the response right now has to be very strong. That's why we ask all our friends and allies to provide us with all the support and all the weapons possible. We understand that 33 billion, in addition to 3.4, which already was provided, it's a huge amount of money. We understand it, and we understand that any country U.S. including, have a lot of domestic agenda about it. But the question is, if we do not stop Russian Federation in Ukraine, we will have to fight them elsewhere. So you, this question is absolutely right. The question is, you know, we all are answering to a question that Putin put on the agenda. Can you be a peaceful country like us and not be attacked? by a nuclear power, by an autocratic regime, and can the world can do something to stop it? And we need to, 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 to answer decisively, so that not only we stop Russia while it's still in Ukraine, but also prevent this from happening again in other places. Okay, to your left, uh, Akbar Ahmed from Huffington Post. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Ambassador, on the issue of civilians on the front lines, Ukrainian officials have asked people to leave Donbass for weeks now. Mm -hmm. How many civilians still remain in that area that you're worried about? Are there still people who are trapped? And are the communications lines open? Are Ukrainian authorities able to connect with people and get them out still? Many great questions in one. Mm -hmm. So first, right now, we have almost 5 million Ukrainians who temporarily fled to the West. We have almost 8 million who are displaced internally in Ukraine. And we have about 10 million, additional 10 million, who live in the areas which are being currently shelled at, you know, the active war zones under occupation. Uh, the majority of them, unfortunately, without gas, water, or with, you know, on and off supplies. Uh, we, of course, uh, in the areas where we see the advancement, the government warns people and asks them to move if they can. Now, a lot of people can't. A lot of people, you know, uh, do not want to leave their houses. I mean, I have to tell you, it was a special operation to convince my mom to move from, from the place. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you but you know, got her out? Well, my husband did. <laughs> so he gets all the credit. But, mm -hmm. So, um, unfortunately, yes, a lot of people are trapped. A lot of people, especially at the beginning of the war, I mean, nobody expected, we all knew that Russians wanted to attack, we all, but nobody expected that level of brutality. I mean, in, 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 it's horrible, but in war you understand when the army, armies fight with each other, right? 
and you understand there could be collateral damages, but specifically targeting civilians, specifically doing all these atrocities on the uncontrolled territories. I mean, raping children, who does things like this? But that's not like a rogue unit or a rogue, it's, it's all of them. This is what they're, this is the MO, this is what they're doing on a daily basis. So, so at the beginning, I think, you know, there was not realization of the magnitude of these crimes. Uh, right now, of course, you know, we are, you know, people are more proactive in, in, in trying to get out, but, but sometimes you can't get out. And plus, again, Russians are targeting specifically the routes. You know, they're targeting the, the evacuation train. Remember Kramatorsk, when, when before this uh, new wave of the battle in the east started, we specifically did try to evacuate people in a very coordinated fashion. So, and as soon as we gathered all the women and children in the rail station, central rail station in Kramatorsk, they specifically hit the place where only children and, and old people and women were. So we are trying, but then again, Ukraine is a large country, not as big as Russia, obviously, but you know, 40 million people. You cannot move the whole country. And you know, some people uh, would like to stay, some people are staying to defend their houses, some people are joining the territorial defense everywhere. So they will defend it. It's, 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 it's all of us defending the country. Hmm. All right, uh, Krista Case Bryant from The Monitor. Thank you so much for being here with us, Ambassador. Uh, you spoke about the existential pressure that Ukrainians feel, um, but not every country that's been attacked has responded in the way that yours has. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the national character or faith or history that's enabled you to demonstrate such resilience over the past several months. Thank you for for this, uh, it's difficult to to find the right answer why we're fighting like we fight now. But I think if I have to guess, I mean, first, for a long time we have been occupied and for a long time we have been attacked. And the first uh, decrees to prohibit the Ukrainian language have been adopted by the Catherine the Great. And since then there was wave after wave after wave of attack on Ukrainian language, attacks on Ukrainian culture, and numerous attempts to try to, you know, suppress Ukrainians and sell this idea, which Putin is openly saying, that there is no, there is no such country, that we do not have the right to exist, that we are Russians, you know, just some kind of different Russians. And so that's why, you know, we became, and after Holodomors, you know, that this uh, death by hunger, which is a very uh, brutal way to, to kill citizens. Because when you see your children dying from hunger, you know, it's, it, it changes the way you behave to everything after that. And it was recent, you know, it was, you know, my grandmother was telling me the stories. My, so it's, it's, but then we were even denied the right to talk about it. There was nothing discussed about Holodomor during the Soviet times. But the resilience and, you know, the, strong ties in the communities. So, the, you know, the central government was somebody foreign always, but the local government was somebody you could trust. So Ukrainians were always very good in living in, the, in communities, trusting somebody in your villages, trusting somebody doing something together. And uh, I guess the very important factor is that in, 2000, in 1991, when we regained the independence, and 98% in Ukraine voted to be independent. And 98% everywhere, including Crimea, mm -hmm. including Donetsk and Lugansk. So it kind of, you know, all this suppressed desire to be free and independent got out in 1991. And then I think the decisive factor is that for 30 years, we have been independent. With all the attacks, with all the puppets installed from Moscow, but we have been independent. And we have a generation of Ukrainians who never knew occupation who never lived in the Soviet Union. And I think that has been a decisive factor. You know, after 30 years, with all the background of the freedom fighting that we had in us for centuries, but after 30 years living in our own country, we said no more. So we've reached, we're just about, at, well, we're at three o'clock. And Can just, just and to add, you know, I think the President Zelensky has been also a very important ingredient of this success. So I think John Gizzi from Newsfax is, really dying to get in one more question. Yes, thank you, Linda, for having us, and thank you, Madam Ambassador. Um, one of the things you recently you, uh, talked about the EU and your application, 
um, NATO still emerges as a stick, sticking point, so to speak. Can you rule out, as many observers uh, have, that uh, Ukraine will try to join NATO at any time in the future, or is it still something on the table? I would encourage you to ask that question uh, from our friends and allies in NATO. But from Ukraine, I would say, you know, more than 60% of Ukrainians before the war, the last uh, poll that we had, supported Ukraine, Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, we, inc we included in 2018 our European integration uh, goal as well as Euro-Atlantic joining NATO in our constitution. For us, it's clear that in our part of the world, especially with the legacies that we had, you either are part, part of the Euro-Atlantic community and the West, so to say, or European Union, or you will be occupied or attacked by Russia. And it happened. So when Russia spreads lies that, you know, this NATO enlargement was the reason or something else, you know, we were neutral before. For 30 years, we, 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 we kept the neutrality. It didn't help us. Russia attacked us in 2014 when we were neutral. Russia attacked Georgia in 2008. Russia attacked uh, uh, Moldova even earlier and created the Transnistria there. So we've seen this, you know, the, the attacks from Russia comes unprovoked, unjustified, and it has been like that for the previous years. So from our side, Ukraine always said that we would like to join the European Union and we would like to join NATO. But it takes the unanimous decision of all other members. Mm. So that has to change. I don't see how the war will change it mm. now. You know, we will keep implementing the standards, the European standards, the NATO standards. We see how the reforms that our military forces have been doing during the past eight years actually to move closer. Because I just want to remind you that we, since 2020, we have the EOP status with NATO. So we had a lot of trainings. We have the annual plans on the, or every year, the annual plans with NATO. And it helped us a lot. Now, of course, you know, it's like talking about the victory, like a picture, uh, the, how will we win? You know, it's similar with, you know, joining other institutions. Let's discuss it when we win and let's get there when we get there. Definitely, I want to say, tell you, should we have, in 2008, Ukraine was going to receive the uh, membership action plan with NATO together with Georgia. And the U.S. has been very supportive in 2008 of this idea. And a lot of countries have been supportive. And definitely Ukrainian leadership did everything possible then, after the first revolution, the Orange Revolution that we had, knowing, because President Yushchenko also knew very well, you know, what we can expect from Russia. So we submitted everything that we were going to get the uh, membership action plan in 2008. And unfortunately, some of our friends and allies, you know, did not vote specifically not to uh, provoke Russia. But I think it's actually vice versa. Should we have been taken into NATO in 2008, we probably would have avoided the war in 2014. And the war today. And the war today. All right. Well, um, my apologies to those who we didn't have time for their questions, but it's been very interesting. And thank you so much for coming. And thank you. I hope you'll come again. Of course. All right. Always. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and if you, you have you. any questions, there is a victim here called Volodymyr. <laughs> and I have a you stack know, of, in charge of the communication. Card. So whatever <laughs> questions you have, just send him, and we will try to respond as soon as possible. You got that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There. Volodymyr, if you can stand, please.
watch it very close. Do you think it will look at the end? I don't know. I don't know that when it's there, I think it's a very important thing. It's a very important thing that I push it, but I don't want a million to do this. It's a very important thing. We have our investment in it. Wow. Wow. Wow.